Yo, yo, I'm Kira Say Gaming, and welcome to the channel. And, well, we're finally on Link to the Past, a game that I most definitely have a lot of memories with. This fun fact was one of the five games I remember playing a lot when I first got into SNES emulation, with the other four being Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, Super Mario World, and Mega Man X. And the funny thing is, as much as I've played the Link to the Past, I never fully completed the game. Now, I'm pretty sure there's a reason, but I'm drawing blanks right now. But anyway, though, let's get this bad boy on a roll and let's talk about A Link to the Past. A Link to the Past is the third game in the Legend of Zelda franchise and released in the US on April 13th, 1992. The game focuses on Link having to fight a dark wizard who kidnapped Princess Zelda, alongside six other princesses. Now, the best way to explain this game is that it's the first Zelda, but a whole lot better. First of all, we're back in the overhead view and my boy Link got some new moves and items. But the best thing about it is that everything that you see in the first Zelda is back but in a much more improved state. Finding dungeons isn't cryptic as hell, there's actual puzzles that are pretty cool, the dungeons themselves aren't filled to the brim with things trying to kill you, and there's an actual map to know where you're going, just fuck yes! The game was a critical and commercial success, and it's often considered to be one of the best games of all time. Oh, and one last thing, almost everything from this game would be the template for future Zelda games as well. Story-wise, gameplay-wise, etc, etc, etc. And with that said, let's go check out what made A Link to the Past one of the best video games of all time. But in order to do that, we gotta go check out that story first because it's actually more in-depth this time. Okay, so if you chill in the main menu for a bit, the game does give you some context towards, of course, what happens prior to the game's event. A couple years prior to the events of the game, a group of thieves led by Ganondorf breaks into the Sacred Realm in order to steal the Triforce. However, dark power begins to leak from the Sacred Realm and starts drawing people in and making them turn evil. This results in a war between Ganon and Hyrule, which results in Ganon being sealed in the Sacred Realm by the Seven Sages. However, after years of peace, catastrophes begin to take place all across Hyrule, with the king requesting help from anyone who may know the cause of the incident. This introduces us to Agaham, a wizard that manages to solve the catastrophes and gets appointed as the chief advisor to the king. And this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is the worst mistake that the king has ever made, as he is killed by Agaham, who then brainwashes all the knights of Hyrule, and kidnaps and transports the descendants of the Seven Sages to another world, with Zelda also being taken as well. And now, we fast forward to the beginning of the game, where Link is awoken by a telepathic plea from Zelda to save her. After Link wakes up, his uncle goes out and tells Link not to leave the house, but um... Fuck that, Link leaves the house of a lantern and follows him to the castle. In the castle, Link finds his uncle fatally wounded, and he gives him his sword and shield and tells him to save Zelda. Link travels through the castle and manages to rescue Zelda, and the two escape through a secret passage and ends up in a church. The priest tells Link to seek out the Master Sword, the Sword of Evil Bane, and it sends him to Shaha. Shaha. Shara, Shara. Okay, never mind. We call him Sasha. Sasha tells Link that in order to get the Master Sword, he must get the three pendants of virtue to prove that he's worthy to wield it. Now this right here takes us to the gameplay, but real quick, before we go to that, can we real quick just admire the graphics and music of this game, cause, oh my god, man, oh my god. The graphics of this game is colorful and lively, not only does Hyrule look more like an actual kingdom than the first two Zelda games, it also feels more alive with more NPCs ranging from townsfolk, witches, Zoras, fairies, and many, many more NPCs. The dungeons themselves can feel cold and dangerous, and are actually multi-leveled as well. The main thing I want to talk about though is the game's usage of the SNES hardware, because some of the 3D effects and backgrounds are still cool years later. Oh, but the music. Oh boy, this hits different, man. The music is oftentimes either triumphant, dangerous, or calming, with the best track in this game being the Fairy Fountain, which like Kingdom Hearts' is dearly beloved, is used for every game and is so damn iconic. Now, there is so much more to talk about with the graphics and the music, but we'll talk about that a little later. Until then, let's go on to the gameplay. Like I said earlier in the video, this game is the first Zelda, but a whole lot better. Link can now move in 8 different directions instead of up, down, left, and right. This also means he can now swing his sword at enemies besides stabbing them, and while he can only swing his sword in 4 directions, this is circumvented by introducing the legendary spin attack. By holding down the B button, Link can charge up his sword and spin it around like a ballerina, hurting slash killing any enemies around him. This makes fighting enemies less stressful, but on the flip side, does kind of switch up how some of the enemies can be killed. Now this isn't the only thing, as Link also has a slew of new items alongside old items he can get in his adventure. Beyond the trademark boomerang, bow and arrow, and bombs, Link also has access to a fire and ice rod, Pegasus boots, 
power gloves, Zora flippers, the cane of Bryna and Samaria, a magic hammer, a hook shot, a flute, three, count them, three magic medallions, a magic cape, and a magic mirror, which we'll explain a little later. The magic mirror returns from Zelda 2, and instead of being used for spells, it's used for items that require it. Now, half of these items are needed to either fight enemies, traverse through Hyrule, or solve a couple puzzles. Meanwhile, the other half are optional, but greatly makes the adventure easier. And these items can also be upgraded to be even more powerful in secret areas in the overworld. Speaking of the overworld, there's a lot more to do around here. The overworld has a bunch of secrets that can be discovered by solving certain puzzles or doing certain side quests. And your prize can usually be a new item, an upgrade to that item, or a heart piece, which if you collect all four pieces, you can increase your HP by one. Okay, so the first half of the game for the most part is linear, though you can spend time exploring Hyrule to get new items or heart pieces, you do have to get dependents in order to advance the story. And this right here leads us to the dungeons, which are so, so much better. Instead of it being a gauntlet of enemies, these dungeons are multi-layered and actually have some pretty interesting puzzles. In every dungeon, you have small keys which are locked behind puzzles, and in order to get that dungeon's item and to face its boss, you need to get the boss key, fight the boss, and not to words, get a heart, upgrade, and then dependent by the bing by the boom. Now, each of the first three dungeons also introduce enemies that reflect the bosses that you have to face, which is actually a really nice touch of detail. Like in the third dungeon, you have to face these slithering enemies that can only be killed from behind. And combined with the layout of the dungeon that has floors that you can fall down in, the dungeon gives you the expectation of dealing with this annoying ass boss. You're gonna hate him, I promise you that. That's some bullshit. Now the other two bosses are easy, and also takes advantage of the SNES hardware. The second boss is the most notable, as you have to strike the boss's head after they lift themselves up from the sand and into the ground. Now after going through two of the dungeons, you go to Death Mountain and meet an old man who gives you a magic mirror, which ends up transporting Link into the dark world where he takes on the form of a... Bunny? Wait, why a bu- uh, okay, never mind. anyway. After going through the third dungeon and getting both the last pendant and the moon pearl, Link goes to the Lost Woods to get the Master Sword, the Sword of Evil's Bane. But soon after, Zelda gets kidnapped from the church, and Link heads to the Hyrule Castle to kick Akaham's ass. And after this royal ass kicking, Link gets sent to the Dark World, and thanks to the moon pendant, allows Link to assume his human form. And holy shit, this is where things get hard. When talking about the look of the Dark World, Nintendo hit it right out the park. Because this looks like hell, a place that I know good and damn well I wouldn't want to step foot into. Everything about this speaks darkness, and any other word that can describe hell, Jesus Christ. And listen, the graphics isn't the only thing that is hell. Let's talk about the gameplay, which I'm telling you right now, you're about to fight for your life. Literally. Okay, now, before I go and explain the dark world, I think I remember why I stopped playing the game after a certain point, and it's because of the Dark World, and it's because I got lost, and I got my ass whooped, on multiple occasions. The Dark World is a sharp increase of difficulty, and I hope you have some patience, because you're gonna die over, and over, and over, and over again. The enemies here can tank hits and hit like a fucking isekai truck. Plus, everything here wants you dead. Luckily, not as bad as Zelda 2. And prepare for this to be a running gag from now on. Okay, now this time there's seven dungeons that can be either hard as fuck, or a little easier. Kind of. Kind of. The dungeons themselves have a lot more complex shit, and you can get lost easily, especially when trying to get to the dungeons themselves. Each dungeon also has a set piece that will make you remember it and add the bosses, and you got yourself the desire to want to say, What the f But lucky for you, there's three things about this alternate world that you might want to sit down and hear for this to make the game a whole lot easier. Now, the first thing is these two bad boys. These two items make the second half of the game a whole lot easier, as both items negate damage from enemies, but the Master Cape also has a special quirkiness about it. With the Master Cape, you could theoretically say, Get fuck, losers. With the Magic Cape, you can turn invisible, allowing you to avoid damage, pass through obstacles, and whoop a boss's ass with no sweat at all. Trust me, get these when you can. Okay, now the second thing is some really cool shit, so check this out, right? With the Magic Mirror, this little thing right here, you can transport yourself from the Dark World and the Light World in order to solve puzzles and do other things. Okay, listen, listen, I promise. 
It's really cool. Let me explain. So this right here is um, the game's main gimmick. As in order to get optional items or have access to certain dungeons, you have to go back to the light world in order to solve whatever world block you're on. However, you have to be careful though as not every area can be used to transport yourself in both worlds. Enemies or obstacles can easily send you back to whichever world you're currently in. So make sure to remember the location relative to your location that you're trying to transport to, okay? Okay. After saving the descendants of the seven sages, including Zelda, they open up the path to Ganon's tower where Link traverses to the top and whoops Agaham's ass again. However, Ganon's body rises from Agaham and he flies over to the Pyramid of Power. Link gives chase and ends up facing off against Ganon in what may be the easiest incarnation of this man yet. Link kills Ganon with the Silver Arrows, recovers the Triforce, and makes a wish to revert the effects of Ganon's reign of the Triforce and restores the land of Hyrule back to normal and actually revives his uncle as well and puts his Master Sword back. That's a nice ending. Happy. Nice. Well, with that out the way, can I be honest about something real quick? Everything about this game is really good. The combat is solid, 95% of the items in this game is useful as hell, and the game encourages exploration and rewards you by making the game easier. And the dungeons, while long, are great little brain teasers. However, the bosses, especially in the second half, felt brutally hard with the exception of a few. And I am most disappointed about the final boss, as this Ganon was so easy to fight, with the only difficult thing being thrown off the battle arena and having to fight him from the very beginning to which I say is bullshit. Anyway, now let's answer the most important question of all. Should you play a Link to the Past? And, well, the answer is clear. Most definitely, and here's why. Okay, if you saw my first Zelda video and decided not to test the game like the plague, then the Link to the Past is a great place to get into Zelda. Everything about this game is solid and polished like hell. And the game's difficulty doesn't come from trying to make it longer, but instead it's based on making a strategy towards bosses and dungeons. Plus, in terms of exploration, this game is big as hell. And for an SNES game, it's massive and honestly, it's very impressive. You can beat this game in 15 hours just going straight through it. But if you do want to explore everything that this game has to offer, it does take up to 17 and a half um, hours to beat, which is not bad actually. Plus, you can play this on many different platforms as well. Now, you do have the SNES version, which you can play here the classic version or just, you know, play it on the SNES classic. You also have the GBA version, which has four swords, and of course, that features an extra quest. And you have the Switch Online service, which of course introduces save states and the rewind function as before. But you don't, you might not need to play this version. Maybe. Maybe. Other than that, thank you guys so much for watching to the end. So, real quick, this is technically the end of the Zelda Marathon. But I didn't want to end it as only three Zelda games. So, for the next video, I am going to do something completely insane, but I've done it before. I'm going to be reviewing two games, technically three games. Yeah, basically it's going to be Link's Awakening and the Oracle games. It's both Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. Unless those last two games are technically the same, may depend. But other than that, after we talk about that, we'll be doing Psychonauts 1 and also Psychonauts 2, which I'm very excited about. And we'll be getting prepared for our next marathon in the next half of September, which let's just say uh, revolves around an RPG franchise. Especially for one that's coming out in November. Mm. Okay. Anyway, though, if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe. And until then, stay safe and stay vibing, my guys. Yeah, yeah.